My name is Alan Bird, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the fourth Global Leadership Summit here at the DeMore McKim School of Business in Northeastern University. Uh, indicated this is a, the fourth summit. Uh, each year has been a, uh, uh, an extraordinary opportunity for academics and executives to come together to share ideas, to explore ideas, and to leave with, with new understanding and also with, uh, I think, renewed enthusiasm for, for both the topic and the work that, that lies before us in this global economy and in this global century. Our theme this year, Le Leadership at a Distance, is particularly timely. I won't uh, say more because I don't want to, uh, to take any thunder away from our, our keynote speaker. But before I go further, it uh, is my pleasure to introduce Dean Hugh Courtney from the DeMoor McKim School of Business to, to provide some welcoming remarks. Dean Courtney. Well, thank you, Alan, for that kind intro. And uh, I really am delighted here uh, to be here, I'm sorry. On behalf of all my colleagues at the DeMoor McKim School of Business and Northeastern University, welcome. Uh, as Alan said, this is our fourth annual Global Leadership Summit, and it's very special to us, and I'll say a few reasons uh, why uh, in my intro remarks here. Um, number one, it brings together such distinguished thought leaders from academics, from business organizations, from consulting and professional service firms, uh, to break new ground in what it takes to lead global organizations successfully. Uh, one of the issues uh, in academic theory uh, today, and certainly in business leadership, and in professional service firms that serve the academics and business leaders, this is a topic that all of us, all of us benefit from uh, further study, discussion, and sharing of best practices. Um, now, of course, we'll focus on the specific skills, particular skills that global leaders need. But importantly, we're also talking about organizations, right? And organizational behavior, uh, their design, their shared values, their mindsets, their structures, their systems, their processes, all of which may enable effective global leadership when you're not there, uh, when distance separates the leader and uh, his or her people. Um, now, it's a, a, a challenge, of course, that all leaders uh, face given their need to focus extensively on both internal and external stakeholders. I mean, certainly something that I have to think about daily as well is how am I spending time uh, in balancing it between being on the road and dealing with our alumni and corporate partners uh, around the globe, and at the same time trying to be close to, uh, to my faculty and staff and students. Uh, so first and foremost, I have some idea of what's going on, right, uh, but also to, to help lead collectively this organization in uh, our joint interests. And it's a challenge uh, when I'm on the road. And as I said, any organization, large and small, has the problem of distance between uh, a leader, his or her leadership team, and uh, the internal stakeholders, uh, because we have this balance between our internal and external stakeholder roles. Um, so I think this year's summit theme, just personally, is a, a really uh, important topic. Um, I also think that this is a, a wonderful place to host you, if I could brag a little bit. Uh, the Memorial McKim School is really committed to developing and disseminating thought leadership on all global business uh, topics. And we really do have one of the most, really fortunate to have one of the most creative, productive, thoughtful, and impactful uh, faculty groups in the world uh, focusing on global leadership issues. Um, thanks to Alan and, and others uh, here today who have really uh, developed this extraordinary team in academic programming over time. Um, you know, the work aims to very importantly uh, shape both academic theory and academic thinking and business practice and is committed to integrating both. That uh, we fundamentally believe that there is no good theory in this place that isn't somehow grounded in practice or informed by practice. And what good is a theory if it isn't uh, implemented in practice and actually has impact on our global organizations? Um, I think that that is, um, unfortunately, far uh, too uncommon 
in higher ed at times to, to really be committed to that integration of theory and practice, but certainly our global leadership initiative here at the Moore McKim School is, is and I'm, I'm quite proud to be part of that. Um, now, uh, finally, in any organization, um, global or otherwise, uh, we must give credit where credit is due. So let me just say a few thank yous before I let us get on uh, with the summit. Uh, first, of course, I want to thank Alan Bird for uh, his leadership now of the, the fourth uh, Global Leadership Summit and doing such a terrific job of convening uh, this group. Uh, I want to think, uh, thank also uh, Martha uh, Majewski as well, who has played a crucial role in probably all of the summits, but I know in particular uh, uh, this one and will be our first keynote speaker today. So Martha, thank you for being here and your leadership. Um, I also want to thank Ann. Where's Ann? She's probably still Ann Benware, who is responsible for uh, all of the event planning and delivery uh, prior, the next two days, and afterwards as well. So she's done an extraordinary job. Thank you, Ann. Um, and third, uh, a special thanks to tomorrow's keynote speaker, who I don't see here yet today, but Bob Hughes from uh, Akamai. Uh, DeMar McKim uh, grad, and importantly, um, uh, a, um, a member of our Board of Visitors who contributes in so many ways to uh, the University and the DeMar McKim School. So in absentia, let's thank Bob also. Um, so, um, and finally, I guess my, my personal thanks to uh, all of you here today, and especially all the DeMar McKim colleagues I see here today. Um, I know that um, you will be creating and feeding the environment today that will lead to the new insights and inspirations that will help all of us lead when we're not there, right? Uh, because it's a universal issue, and I think we've got a great group here today. We see the benefits of actually co-location uh, today uh, and making that happen, but hopefully this is a group that will stay connected and will continue to lead uh, virtually our efforts and the efforts back in, in your own organizations. Welcome. Thank you. Let me get back to Alan, and then we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Courtney. <clears throat> it's my, uh, my, my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, my co-chair for this summit, uh, Dr. Martha Masnevsky from IMD in Lausanne, Switzerland. Um, <clears throat> You have in your, uh, in your program notes uh, uh, an introduction and a, and a brief bio sketch of Martha. But I would like to uh, provide a different sort of uh, introduction. <clears throat> I was uh, reflecting as we were coming into this that uh, I have known Martha for 22 years. I think she was, what, 12 years old at the time we first met. Uh, and. Uh, it has been one of those serendipitous meetings that, um, that has developed in, in many ways. But I wanted to give you some insights into her thinking. Um, I, and I can't recall the exact year, I'm sure Martha could, but about three or four years after we met, um, I was out living in California and uh, we were headed to the Academy of Management meetings. Uh, which were in San Diego that year, and she said, uh, "If you've got a, uh, if you've got some time, I'd like to uh, like to spend a day with you, uh, because I have some ideas about uh, things that need to be done." And I said, "Well, come on out by all means." And she came out, and we went uh, we went kayaking out on the estuary near Morro Bay. For any of you who are familiar, that's a beautiful spot. And uh, while we were paddling in that uh, that beautiful setting. Um, she said, I'm concerned that, uh, <clears throat> that academics don't talk to practitioners as much as they should. Um, and I'm concerned that we in academia don't, uh, don't really uh, move the needle the way that we ought to be moving the needle. And I would like to bring a group of people together. And uh, I'd like you to help me think about who those people are that we ought to bring together. And I don't want this to be an organization. Um, I would like this to be a network. I like people who are loosely connected, and I'd like to have a group of people who don't know everybody else in the network, but instead uh, use those relationships within the network to connect with others. Um, and that was, the, uh, that was the start of an extraordinary organization 
that, uh, well, I called it an organization. Oops, I slipped there. It was the start of a beautiful network called ION. And uh, I'll, I'll share stories about that with anybody who, who wants to uh, take a long nap sometime. But in the meantime, uh, that, uh, that organization and that conversation stayed with me. And uh, as I came to Northeastern, one of the thoughts I had in mind was, how can we get academics and executives talking to one another in meaningful ways? How can we uh, have people who are wrestling with the same problems, asking uh, similar but often not identical questions, uh, using different language, uh, using different vocabularies? Uh, how can we how can we get them to help one another better understand the challenges that we face? Um, that was really the genesis for, uh, for the Global Leadership Summit was that, uh, that, that paddle on, the, on Morro Bay uh, tw about, eight, about 20 years ago. Uh, so it's, it's my pleasure now to, to introduce Martha, and uh, she will introduce a topic, one that uh, she and I have had lengthy conversations about. And as I promised before, I won't say a word more. It's simply my pleasure to turn the time over to Martha Masnevsky. Welcome. It's great to have you at, at the summit. And thank you for that very kind introduction, Alan. I do remember paddling. I was saying to Christine, we, had, we saw otters. You might not remember that, but I remember the otters. It was good. Um, I, this, I, I, I love this topic, um, leading when you're not there. And as I started to think about how I, I would do this, the keynote at the beginning of the summit should frame the summit should frame the topic, should help us put all the rest of our ideas into place, should bring together the practice and the research. So I was thinking about how to do this, and a lot of my research over the years has been about virtual teams, global teams, collaboration across distances. So I was thinking about, well, you know, I could do a part on virtual teams, I could do another section on trust, because that's an important topic. And then I thought, what does the question really mean? So if we ask managers, I get asked this question all the time. How do I lead people when I'm not with them? And, and usually it comes across something like this, right? So the executives look a little bit like this. Uh, they, they're either exhausted at computer screens or they're in an airport somewhere and I happen to meet them uh, anywhere around the world at an airport. And they, you know, they say things like this, you know, I, uh, I got one more email that I have no idea how to understand. Okay, somebody might have used Google Translate, or it might even be in words that I just, you know, I don't know. Uh, or uh, one more phone call that I need to do. You know, please, please let it be 8 a.m. in Liverpool soon so that I can get this call over with and finally go to sleep, right? Uh, or, you know, nothing beats face to face. I know I have to get on this airplane. I know I have to be there, but I'm exhausted. I'd rather be with my family, but you know, it's worth it. Uh, or, you know, with all this great technology, I shouldn't have to get on a plane, right? I should be able to do this virtually. Okay, so these are the kinds of questions I get asked. So how can I lead when I'm not there? And I say, okay, are you really asking how to stay awake at night? Are you really asking how to use the technology? Or is there something else that you're asking? How can we get underneath and behind those questions? So that's me asking questions, right? Kind of, ha, huh? tell me, tell me what you really mean. And if I, if I take a look at the questions that people ask, I think they categorize into three main buckets. And so what I'm gonna do is, is structure this keynote around these three buckets. The first bucket is this, how do I make sure that things get done the way they're supposed to get done and get done correctly. Okay, if I'm not there to watch, to monitor, to problem solve, to troubleshoot, how do I know things are gonna get done? Okay, so that's the executing question. The second one is, is a more emotional one. It's how do I show I care? You know, if I, I, I really like my employees and I want them to know that I care, I want them to be engaged and committed and I would like to show that I'm engaged and committed. How do I do that when I'm not there? So I call that the engaging bucket. And the third bucket is how do I connect people with each other? 
So not only am I not there, but I want them to be able to connect with other people who are not there so that they can get synergies and, and learning and transfer knowledge and work together. And that's how we can get scale and ad adaptation. Okay, so, so those are the three main buckets of questions that I hear over and over again. You know, if I kind of push and, and say, what, what do you really need? Um, and, and I think these questions are fundamentally different from each other. And the answers to them about how do we lead when we're not there are actually quite different to each of these. Now, of course, global leaders need to look after all three of them. But I think if we look at them separately, we can start to look at the requirements for each. I also think, this is, this is my guess, but I'm, I, I, I'm open to say, no, 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 this is wrong. But I think they go in this order. Okay, first you worry about number one, then you worry about number two, then you worry about number three. Now, of course, I think if you get number one right, it helps you on number two and that helps you on number three or vice versa. Um, but, I, but I think they also go in that order. So what I'd like to do is, is dive into each one a little bit further, um, share with you some examples uh, about it, and then identify kind of some, some key thoughts around the leadership imperatives for each of these. Um, and, then, uh, and then I'll use that to set the agenda for the rest of the summit. Sound okay? Phil, was that a question? Is it a, that's, an, that's an approval, all right. Good, uh, and we can make, it's, it's, we're, we're a, a nice sized group, so if you have questions or comments as we go along, please uh, shout them out, and if we're running short on time, I'll say, we'll, we'll talk about that later, okay? All right, so let's take a look at the first one. The first one is about executing, just get it done right. Now, I, for each of these, I have kind of a, a story for you. This story happened last week. Uh, I was in Japan last week, and when I'm teaching in Switzerland, uh, often, you know, especially after lunch, you have a group of people who are a little bit sleepy. Okay, now I know that's not true for anybody here today. But, but you know, at, at IMD we do so. And if I have a Japanese participant in the group, I will always ask that Japanese participant to come to the front and lead us through exercises. Okay, because that wakes everybody up. And I, I'm not a Japan expert, but I've worked with lots of Japanese participants, so I know everybody does exercises in the morning and everybody knows how to do this. You know this, right, Alan? Okay. So last week I was teaching in Japan. And Tuesday, at Monday afternoon, I was greeted with a group of very sleepy looking participants after lunch. And I, and I said, okay, well, if I were in Switzerland, I would ask a Japanese participant to come to the front and lead the exercises, but here I have 29 of you. So can I have a volunteer, somebody come to the front and lead the exercises? And, you know, they kind of looked at each other, like, is she crazy? And, and I assumed that the, the crazy look was something to do with face or hierarchy or we don't do this uh, in training programs or something like that. But anyway, eventually they nudged somebody and, and he put his hand up and, and he came up to the front. And the first thing he did was find the YouTube video on my computer for Rajo Taizo, okay? Um, and then he went to sit down. And I was like, no, 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 you, got, you know, we need you to lead this. Okay, so he stood in front. As soon as the music started, I realized something that I had not known before about these Japanese exercises. And again, those of you with Japan expertise would know this. It was, just took me a while to learn. Which is that everybody in the country does exactly the same set of exercises every morning throughout their school career for 60 years. Okay, the Japanese government identified 60 years ago a set of exercises, about three and a half minutes, and every school kid does exactly the same exercises all over the whole country every, every day. So by the time you're an adult, this is just ingrained inside you, and you don't need a leader. So the looks they gave each other were not, had nothing to do with face or hierarchy, they were all about we don't need a leader, we all know what to do. And so I thought this is, this is related to the first lesson about how to lead when you're not there. It's if everybody knows what they're doing and is somehow motivated to do it, you know, there are clear expectations and they know what to do and they're, and they're at least marginally motivated to do it, you don't need a leader. Okay, so leading when you're not there is about creating those conditions. 
So let me give you a company example of this. This is a company I, I'm working with right now at, at IMD. And I, I had uh, this company in a few weeks ago, Sika. They're in the construction chemicals industry. So sealants, uh, sealants for swimming pools and caulking and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and as, uh, as a lot of it's a sales company. So they do a lot of R&D, but it's huge sales. And every day at, uh, in the afternoon in Europe, they have a daily sales report that comes through to every manager's email at exactly the same time. They call it the cash register. It's a very short report uh, that just has some key figures for the different markets. And everybody, when it comes through, knows exactly what to do. So if you're teaching this group, some mid-afternoon, late afternoon, every email in the room goes bing and goes off at exactly the same time. And you just have to stop, okay? That's the, the whole company just stops when that email goes off. Everybody pulls it out and looks at it. And everybody knows exactly what to do next. Okay, so you've got clear competences, clear information, clear routines around this. It also is nice because, uh, it, because you've got a company culture, at least at Sika, which is, is both competitive but also supportive. So if my numbers are up and yours are down, first I'll say, ha ha, you're going to have to worry. But then the next thing I do is go over to you and see if I can help you, okay, if we're in the same room. So it's a very clear routine. Everybody knows exactly what to do. So I think on the, on the first one, getting things executed. Okay, making things happen, leading when you're not there. This one is, is relatively straightforward, even if it's not easy. Okay, so first of all, there has to be a business imperative. You have to, as a business, have clear prioritization. If the Sika uh, cash register had 17,000 different things on it, nobody would know what to do with it. Okay, very clear prioritization in your business. Uh, limit those priorities, limit the global requirements, and make sure that they are really important, they're meaningful. Okay, and so as a business, you've got to figure that out first. Second, there's a, there's a social imperative, and that one's about creating meaningful communication. Okay, meaningful means people actually understand it uh, from their own point of view. I often say for the, if, if, I had, uh, if I had a nickel for every time I've heard from somebody, our strategy is not very clear, then I wouldn't need ever to work again. Right? And I've never heard it from CEOs, but I've heard it from just about every other level of the organization. Right? So clarity obviously doesn't just come from, I said it a million times. Clarity comes from communicating in a way that other people understand it. Uh, and that's, that's tough. The organizational imperative, the organization needs to have discipline around these, around these things. Uh, so procedures, processes, management reports. Uh, this is really boring. Uh, it's, it's hygiene stuff. But if you can't prioritize and get the discipline around it, then you're not going to be able to lead when you're not there. Um, inconsistency. And then what does that mean for the leader? The leader, it means has to understand both clarity and context, okay? which, is, which is much more difficult than it sounds. Right? The leader has to know exactly what's going to be the same everywhere, whether it's the cash register procedure or the, the Rajo Taizo exercises or the shop floor uh, management procedure, whatever it is. But the leader also has to understand how it's going to be interpreted differently in different contexts and how people will make sense of it. And so that's related to a lot of perception management if I go to the global leadership competences as well. Okay, so let me just pause there. So that's executing when you're not there. Comments, questions? Blank faces. How do you get the fleet back? What do you mean by that? Well, so you're assuming that people are executing and they're doing what they're supposed to do. But, but if you were an on-site manager, you would be visibly seeing that, whether that actually happens or not, and yeah. implications. When you're not physically there, there's got to be some other kind of feedback loop that you're getting. 
Yeah, yeah. No, so, so how do we get a feed? I'm just, I have to repeat it for the microphones. Let's say, how do, for the recording, how do you get a feedback loop to make sure that the monitoring? That's a, it's a good question. Uh, and so I think there's uh, in in the systems that I'm talking about, there's a feedback loop in the data connect collection. Right, so, so if these processes really are universal and you've got them well monitored, there's going to be some kind of data collection that you can, you can see somehow. Uh, clearly, the other part of the data collection is talking to people or emailing or seeing those reports, which is also related to the discipline and the communication. And I would say that the feedback loop also has to be part of whatever that process is okay, and discipline around that. It sounds really boring, right, that word discipline, but I think on executing, that's really what it's about. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Anything else? You know, was, these are the kinds of things that are, they're, they're important anywhere. Um, but if, you, if you're not there, then they're critical. If you're there, then you can kind of, like, exactly like you're saying, well, if it doesn't work, I can kind of figure it out. But if you're not there, then it's really important. OK, well, let's get to the more interesting ones then. All right, so the second one. Um, is about uh, engaging, sustaining identity and commitment. So this one, this story is, uh, you can see the little animals up here. Um, I was traveling recently with some colleagues who have young children, and mine are adults now, so I'd forgotten what it's like to travel when you have young children. And you have to phone them at exactly the right time every day before they get on the bus, but after they've had their breakfast and all that kind of stuff. Um, and as I was thinking about this, I remembered that my, my younger daughter, who's now 19, when she was about five or six, she was passionate about stuffed animals. Okay, and I'm sure your kids have been through all of this as well. And, and she had two animals, a pair of them, that were, were these two. So they're, these are the T.Y. Beanie Babies, if any of you grew up with your kids having these, right? Um, and there, were, there was a large one and a small one that were exactly the same. And she would say that the large one is the mommy and the small one is the baby. Okay, fairly typical, right? Um, but then when I went traveling, she sent me with the baby in my suitcase all the time. And she would tell me that the mommy and the baby cats can talk with each other and they can pass on messages. So when she, and she would keep the mommy beside her all the time while I was gone. So she would tell me that when she hugged the mommy, the baby would feel it. And then the baby would tell me. And so then I should hug the baby, and then the baby would tell the mommy, and the mommy would tell her. Now this is where you say, aw, this is very cute, huh? Um, it, was, it, was, it was lovely, um, and, and it was really, it was sweet, it was our special routine, but it was very much about, uh, about connecting. And this is another part, um, I think, of leading when you're not there, is finding symbolic ways to demonstrate the bonding and the connection. So the bonding and the connection doesn't, uh, happens when you're there, or at least it happens through various interactions. I mean, sometimes you need to bond with people that you'll never see. Uh, but whatever, however you get the bonding, it needs to be symbolized so that you can reconnect with it somehow. Uh, and and this, this story really helped me to do that. So then if I, again, if I look at, at organizations in doing this, this is uh, Anna's company, Skanska, uh, has a, a very strong strategy based on values. And they've been a very strong value-based organization for, for a long time. Not forever, but for a long time. Um, this is particularly about their ethics, but they're, they're very strong in ethics, inclusion, and green. Uh, and all of these three, but particularly the, and safety, sorry, the ethics, the safety, and the green became important values in the company after incidents or accidents. Okay, so something happened, a big ethics scandal, a big safety problem, a big environmental problem, some kind of, they're in the construction and development industry, sorry. So, so building highways and building big uh, buildings. Um, and uh, each time after one of these things happened, they stopped as a company and they said, that should not happen. You know, we care about people. We care about our employees. We care about the environment. We can't ever let that happen again. 
And so they, they structured things around the company. And of course, they're in an industry that's a dangerous industry that does a lot to the environment and that has a, a poor ethics record. Um, and I put the, the Stieg Larsson book up there. If any of you have read The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, have you read that book? You might remember that the corporate bad guys in that whole book are Skanska. Okay, so uh, you can, <laughs> and you all know it, right? Um, yeah, so, so that was related to the incident around ethics. Um, but it's interesting to see how in this company the reaction to that has been very deeply about values, and we hold the values. Uh, so the CEO, everybody in the company uh, repeats these values again, and including admitting that we made mistakes. And we can't do that again because we care. And I've worked with people all around uh, uh, half the world for Skanska, and it's amazing to see how these, this focus on values and some of the symbols around it. Okay, so they've got some zero symbols, they've got uh, various ways of doing it, but I think the, the big symbols are the stories around the accidents or the things that have happened that really pull people into their hearts and they say, mm, we're not gonna let that happen again. And it gives people around the world the strength and the courage to stand up against problems. So yes, they still have ethical problems occasionally. Yes, they still have safety problems occasionally. But wherever you are in the company, if you don't want to put up with that, you, you can stand up and say, no, it stops here, and you know that you'll be supported. Okay? And so, so this leading with powerful values, but then also the symbols that go with the values, I think is the key to unlocking how do I lead when I'm not there, showing people that I care or that we care and getting the engagement and the commitment? So um, again, if we, if we go through these, these imperatives, from a business imperative, what does it mean you need in your business? Uh, it means you need a purpose. The values are going to be linked to a purpose. And leading people when you're not there to engage and get commitment is going to be a lot about purpose. Why are we an organization in the first place? And Skanska, in fact, has just gone through re-articulating that. Um, higher, it draws on universal human values. Uh, you can have a purpose, you can have all kinds of purposes, but the ones that are going to get people engaged and committed and caring are the ones that link into these universal human values somewhere, especially if you're globally distributed. From a social imperative, what do we need to, to organize or, or make happen in terms of social identity or social um, patterns is this is about identity. So helping people socially identify with the organization and with those values. Identity uh, is defined as uh, it's part of my definition of who I am. Uh, individually and socially, so the groups that I belong to. And if, if you're successful, I'm successful. So I care about you being very successful, okay? Uh, and you care about me being successful. So that's identity. So employees' social identity becomes linked with that purpose. And because they're linked with the purpose, they're linked with the organization and with you as leaders. So that's uh, uh, what needs to happen at a social level. Organizationally, that means symbols and stories. This is organizational culture. And again, if you're, if you're all together, organizational culture is important. But if you're spread out and not seeing each other, organizational culture is vital in order to keep people caring. Uh, and finally, what does this mean for you as a, for people as leaders? Uh, it means obviously building trust and building trust through that identity, living your values, uh, because the minute you're inconsistent with the values of the purpose, then you're not going to be cre able to create the trust um, and, you, and the, the leadership won't be consistent anymore. And then authenticity, which is uh, related to integrity and living your values. Okay, so that's the second big bucket of questions. And what I hope is th this slide is, is kind of setting the agenda for both research and practice. So let me pause again there. Comments, questions, observations, examples? Yeah. Nice. 
I like that. So, so personal, each person has a personal purpose that's somehow linked to the organizational purpose. Uh, and by linking the personal purposes, then you're, you're also um, making public the authenticity, which legitimizes it in a way and also allows people to come together differently, or di more strongly, I think. Yeah, it's a great example. Yeah. I, and I think these kinds of processes are really important to leading when you're not there. Yeah. Throw out a friendly challenge. Mm -hmm. so the great remote leaders would be God, Big Brother, and the Wizard of Oz. Okay. None present uh, physically. Um, in, in each story, uh, there's a lot of fear. <coughs> there's a, a certain amount of shame and guilt that dominates. And certainly, that has been one of the images in the uh, literary genres that this remote thing can sense you and, and you can be found out. I'm, I'm curious, these are all very humanistic and positive. Yeah. But uh, you know, remote monitoring, uh, swift and uh, uh, uninfluenced justice, <laughs> yeah. you know, that, that also can work as remote control. I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's related more to the first question. So for, for God and the Wizard of Oz, and what was the third example? Big Brother, right. For all three of them, they're, 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 the, the, the negative monitoring was more, is more around execution. Inspirational logic. There's a higher good Yeah, yeah. I think that's not inconsistent with what I'm saying. Yeah, no. It strikes me as a very positive and uplifting story, but I'm also concerned that there's counter stories. They kind of, yeah. may use the same techniques, but in different but it, yeah. So, 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 so two responses to that. That's interesting, right? Um, the negatives of the dark side of, of uh, influencing and leadership, right? I think, uh, so my two responses. The first is, um, if you put these two things together, right? Number one and number two. Number one is about get executing and getting things done. And I do think that the discipline, the monitoring, the feedback loops, uh, um, uh, holding people accountable to certain standards will often have some negative uh, 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 pu not punishment, well, maybe punishments, depending on where you are. Um, but, uh, you know, pay being docked or, or not getting bonuses, um, not getting promotions, not getting resources, right, if you don't execute properly. Um, but the, the, the second part is the support of helping people learn how to do it if they can. And I think the two together hmm, is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, I'm not. I, I'm not convinced of my own logic now. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, kind of following on that, there's also a bit of a, a push and pull or dichotomy between your first point with the influence and the monitoring, the oversight, and creativity and innovation, and um, you know having that as a value amongst yeah. your employees. And how do you? That's another delicate balance. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you keep one? and the other at the same time. Yeah, because the first one's not about creativity and innovation, is it? No. 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 You in this day and age. Maybe. Yeah, absolutely you need it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I, and at the same time, I've worked with a lot of companies who are saying, we have so much creativity and innovation, but we're not making profits. And 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 we we actually need a few a lot you know in order to fund next year's innovation. Otherwise, we can't do it. Um, so this is this is the balance, right? So how do you how do you get both of those at the same time? And I think that's partly why I wanted to separate these two questions and not ignore the first one, uh, because leading when you're not there does mean executing and monitoring and and uh, and making sure stuff gets done. Um, otherwise, some of the other things are are. E even less meaningful, right? If being able to accomplish something in the first place gives you license to be able to do some of the other things. Well, I don't know that innovation, you can say, okay, we're going to make the brand new iPhone, right? That type of innovation. But even creativity um, and people taking personal responsibility and accountability for their role in the organization versus being an automate. Right. Right? So that's another side of that. Yeah. So, 
and, and and how do you how do you do so, that? So if you but if you think about the two, I think you can have both both one and two at the same time. I know I prioritize them that you need number one first and then you need number two, but I think you can have them pretty closely right after each other um, or even at the same time, especially if you've got a good organizational infrastructure, right? Uh, so, so this is number this is number one. So you need clear prioritization, meaningful communication, uh, some some procedure systems, cons competence development, clarity in the context, right? That's what you need for number one. One. And for number two, you need a higher purpose. You need social identity linked with the purpose. You need symbols and stories, trust and values. I think you can have both of those at the same time. I think it's just helpful for managers to know that, that they do different things. Uh, and they're not necessarily conflicting. They're different. Um, but, but people who are, are managing and working in companies, I think, are complex enough to be able to hold both of those and see them both at the same time. Uh, no, I like this dialogue. It's helpful. It's good. The last one that I want to come to, and I think this also comes to the creativity. That's why I move on, is about this connecting, connecting for scale and synergies. This is one of my favorite stories, Isaac Asimov's Foundation. Have any of you read it before? Isaac Asimov, the Foundation series? Okay, if your hand did not go up, then it should go up in the next three months, please. <laughs> Um, this is, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big science fiction reader, but this is, if you're only ever going to be read one science fiction novel, this should be it. I see a few nods, okay. Uh, so Isaac Asimov wrote uh, a grandmaster of science fiction. The Foundation series is probably his, uh, his main masterwork. Um, it's a story about a guy named Harry Seldon. Uh, and Harry Seldon invented a science called psychohistory, which is the ability to predict human behavior. Okay? And it took a long time to develop, and it was impossible. It has some basic tenets, which I think are really interesting. Uh, the first tenet is that you can never, with any certainty, predict the behavior of a single human being at a single point in time. Okay? Even 30,000 years in the future, you can never predict the behavior of a single human being at a single point in time with any certainty. The second tenet is that you can, with more certainty, predict the behavior of a single human being over time. And the third is that you can, with complete certainty, not now, but 30,000 years from now, you can, with complete certainty, predict the behavior of groups of people over time. Okay. So this is the, these are the basic tenets, and they, you know, they use the, he used them to apply, to predict, uh, you know, to, to explain the past work, so then he used it to predict the future. Harry Seldon used it pr to predict the future, and what he saw is that the galaxy, which uh, you know, humans were spread throughout the galaxy on, on thousands of planets, uh, trade uh, and civilization going between all of them. So Harry Seldon found that the, the galaxy, the galactic empire, was headed for a big dark age. Big crash, big dark ages. Okay, so he went to the emperor, like any good employee would do. He went to the emperor and said, guess what, boss? We're headed for a big cliff, and we're going to go off the cliff. And it'll, dark ages, no civilization, thousands and thousands of years, it'll be terrible. And the boss, the emperor, did what any good boss would do. He said, okay, well, fix it, prevent it. You know, we don't want this to happen. Too late, it's going, you know, can't stop it, fix it. Blah, blah, blah. Went back and forth. Finally, Harry Seldon said, here's what I can do. If you give me the resources, I can set things up so that after the crash, the crash doesn't last nearly as long. The crash will only last 1,000 years instead of 10,000 years. And the society that comes out the other side will be better off than the one that we have now. So the emperor said, OK, go do it. So he did. And that's what the books are about, is, is about, about what happens. Now, this is kind of the ultimate example of leading when you're not there. Uh, because what Harry Seldon did was set up the conditions so that what people did with those conditions would end up leading to a good outcome. And I often use this book uh, to, to start my organizational behavior classes as required leading. Because I think one of the roles of a leader is not, not just to, you, I mean, you can never predict or control the behavior of a single person at a single point in time. Your role as a leader is to set up the conditions under which people will do things that end up being better. Okay, so this is kind of the ultimate of, of leading when you're not there. Harry Seldon was, was long gone while, while this was happening. 
Um, and I think that the story tells us a lot of things about how to set up conditions for people to be able to connect, even if you have nothing to do with it. So the, related to the last question, this is a, a woman that I know, um, Christine, Christina Wall, who used to work at Grundfos, so that's uh, the Grundfos pumps up at the top. She now works at Ingersoll Rand. Um, and when she was working at Grundfos, she became the first um, director of a business that, w that went across countries. So she was doing, running an industry group. These are industrial pumps. And she was doing a group for the, the food services industry that went across countries. And before that, Grundfos had always been organized by countries. Okay, so she was really trying to innovate something quite different. And she had a, a team where nobody on the team reported to her. Okay, they all reported to their country directors. And her leadership was to convince them to work together to build applications and to sell applications for this one industry. Okay, it's not a terribly interesting industry for most people. Uh, but, but what she was doing was very interesting through it. It took her three years to build this group. Because, uh, because she had no direct authority. So her leadership was all through informal authority. Okay? And so she had to convince people to work together. She had to, and, and of course, she was, none of them were ever together, and she was never there. So she did all of these other things, right? She built processes and procedures for doing sales, for, uh, for um, getting customer information. She built very strong relationships with each of the people on her team. Uh, they had a lot of good symbols around that. Um, but the last, the last thing was how to get them to work with each other without her being there. So she did a lot of things about getting initiatives going, uh, sharing information, um, you know, hey, you should see what they're doing over in that country. Oh, tell me. No, 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 you pick up the phone and you call so that you're building the relationship and it doesn't always come through me. So I said it took her three years, but by the time she finished, um, I asked her, how did you know it w when it became successful? It was partly by the numbers. Clearly they were seeing sales numbers. But the other part of it was... She said, I knew it, was be it became successful when I started receiving requests from headquarters that had not gone through me. So for example, for R&D projects. So they were starting to request joint R&D projects or joint sales projects that didn't have to go through her. Okay, so in other words, I was leading successfully when I wasn't there, when I saw that they didn't need me as a leader anymore. The collaboration was happening without me. And I think this is kind of the, the ultimate of leading when you're not there. If you've got these other things going on, the dualities that we just talked about, I think if you can get those, but you can push it a little bit further, then this is the opportunity. So um, I think uh, there's, a, again, a business imperative around this. And this is about vision. Okay, if the last one was about purpose, this is about vision. Uh, what will we look like? When will we look like that? Because if you don't have a vision, then people don't know what to coordinate around. Um, and it connects your purpose together with a strategy of where we're going. The social imperative is about distributed authority. This is extremely difficult for people. But this is the ability to take up leadership when it's needed, but also to step back from leadership when, you, when it's necessary for somebody else to come forward. Most leaders can't do this. And so I'm going to, you know, I put it up there as a single line. Um, but in my experience, this is the hardest thing for leaders to be able to do, to step forward and step back as needed. Okay? And of course, as needed is a, is a huge thing in itself. Huh? Uh, the organizational imperative then, of course, is to, is to build and support lateral networks, cross-boundary communication and collaboration. Uh, build and support, and, and of course the ironic thing about these networks is you can't just command them. Uh, reporting lines in the organization chart, you can say here's what it is. Lateral networks by definition require a much more organic way of supporting. Uh, and so the leadership imperative, I'm going to say it's servant leadership. Uh, and, and you may or may not know about servant leadership as a, as a school or philosophy of leadership. It's basically the idea of leading from behind. So leading in a way that empowers others and doesn't put yourself up in front. So sharing power, helping others to increase their influence. Uh, and if I look at the people I know who are good at increasing this kind of collaboration across boundaries when they're not there, 
it's people who would be good at, at servant leadership. What, one of the original definitions of su servant leadership came from the Tao Te Ching. Uh, when his work is done, his task complete, his followers will say, we did this ourselves. And so, so this is a, I, I, if I look at the three buckets of questions, the first one about executing, the second about engaging, the third about uh, connecting, the first two are really about overcoming the barriers of not being there. The third one is about finding opportunities in the configuration of distribution, which also happens to mean we're not there. Okay, if you were there all the time, you wouldn't have this, this distribution of people being in different places. So the third one's really about that opportunity, so it's, it's quite different. Just watching the time, let me just, let me just finish a couple of things and then we can have some general dialogue. So here are the three questions again. Um, executing, engaging, and connecting. Right, the, fir the first two are about overcoming barriers. I just said that, okay. Uh, Here's where the academic research is hiding. So you notice until now, except at the beginning, I talked a little bit about academic research. Um, but I haven't said so much about it since then. I've been looking at it much more from a practice point of view. I'm, the, the academic research is all over the place. There's a ton of academic research on these things. It's all on the pieces. And so you can look at the, the research on, gl on global leadership competences. You can look at the research on authentic leadership. You can look at the research on servant leadership, on virtual teams, on social networks, on power and authority. There's a lot of research on each of these topics. I think the challenge for academics is that it doesn't come together around, uh, around meaningful ways. Um, so I think uh, this is a challenge to us over the next couple of days. Research and, and practice could collaborate a little bit more. For, uh, researchers tend to see the, the elephant like this, right? It's, uh, well, there's this piece of the elephant and this piece of the elephant and this piece of the elephant. Um, managers tend to see the elephant like this. Oh my gosh, there's a whole herd of elephants that are about to run over me. And we can all help each other by, by relating the pieces around a context uh, or by analyzing the subcomponents so that it's not just this one big mess. And I think by doing that, we can, we can make headway on, uh, on both pushing the boundaries of the research. Um, because I think some of the research that we're doing is it, by being so bounded, it doesn't help us answer big questions. On the other hand, from practice point of view, if, if we can't, uh, if we only see it as these big elephants coming at us, then we don't end up with very practical answers. So I think, uh, yeah, this is, I just wanted to finish by setting the agenda. Uh, These themes that we're looking at over these next couple of days are, are really about bringing those things together. We've got two panels. One is about how to get there. So it's a process of how do we move towards an organization that's more competent at leading when you're not there. We have a second panel tomorrow about trust. I mean, clearly one of the underlying pieces of all of this is, is you can't lead when you're not there without trust. So what does that mean and how do we understand it? We've got four thought leader sessions and you'll see each of them relates to different pieces of what I've just talked about. Mindfulness, uh, paying attention to the situation, being aware of the situation is related to communication, it's related to building trust, it's related to pulling people together across boundaries. Values and identity, I talked about it related to bucket number two about engagement and commitment, uh, but it's also going to be related to the other ones as well. We've got creative use of technology. You notice I haven't talked about technology. Companies usually think the solutions are all in technology. We just need, you know, if we only had more bandwidth. Um, but in fact, the, the underlying dynamics, of course, are not about technology. At the same time, if you know what you're looking for in the underlying dynamics, there are some very creative ways to use simple technologies to achieve much more than we think. And so we'll have a, a thought leadership workshop tomorrow on creative technologies. And then leading in fragmentation and fluidity is our, is our fourth thought, work, thought leader workshop tomorrow. Um, and that's also a lot related to uh, both the different contexts that we're in around communication or trust building. It's all these different contexts. And then it's also how can you pull it together. So it's very much related to bucket three. So all of the different sessions that we've got are 
different ways of coming into to these things. Um, but I think if we keep these three basic questions in mind, executing, engaging, and connecting, then hopefully my hope is that, we could, that it will help us with the dialogue. So that's where I'm going to leave. We have a couple minutes still for questions? Comments, yep. Yeah. So I, I, so the question is how do how do we adapt this model, especially the importance of trust, to places where trust is not so easily gained? Um, you're more of an expert in that part of the world than I am. That being said, my my experience is that different cultures gain develop trust differently, but but trust still means the same thing everywhere. So the indicators for getting to trust or the behaviors for getting to trust may be different from one culture to another. But what trust gives you in different cultures is exactly the same once you get there. Um, trust is about vulnerability and uncertainty and being able to look after, knowing that you're going to look after each other when there's that vulnerability and uncertainty. And, and what you see in different cultures is that the uncertainty and the vulnerability are around different things. Uh, in the United States, the vulnerability is not about the system. It's, it might be about uh, something else, whereas in Russia or Eastern Europe, the vulnerability might be more about the system, so you need more trust in the family or other relationships, right? And so, I, you know, the first part is, is understanding what is it that creates trust in that environment. The second is accepting that you, as a leader, may or may not be able to completely get into that trust cycle. But, but taking it as far as you can with patience. And I think that's, that's where the mindfulness comes in, the ability. So, so these three buckets, right, in the end they come down to three things and hopefully it, it's, it's simplifying it a lot to say these three buckets. But hopefully it lets us get into some of these more complex questions in useful ways. Yeah. But we're gonna talk about that tomorrow morning, too, on trust. Yes? I have a general question about slide before this, uh, regarding collaboration between academics and practitioners. Mm -hmm. How much of that is really happening as far as you know? Well, that's, it's, it's happening today. Yes, I know. That's why we're here. <laughs> yeah. At, at IMD, we, it happens a lot because that's that's our DNA. It's, um, it's who we are. Uh, but. Um, it's it. Ugh. I mean, this is a big question, right? This is this is why we have it. Um, you know, I think it's easy to blame, for example, the academic system, which is focused on tenure and and writing academic articles, and there's a whole reward system that does not reward talking to practitioners. I think it's also easy to blame practitioners who are too busy to slow down to to look at the ideas. I think um, what's more helpful is to ask questions like, how are we speaking different languages? And how can we learn each other's languages well enough to help each other out? And who can be really the bridges? And who can be the bridges, yeah, exactly. And, and this is exactly why Alan and I are, are so passionate about summits like this. I don't think all practitioners or all academics need to be the bridges. Correct. But we need to have enough bridges and they need to, to be able to go back and influence other people so that we get the answers, yeah. 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 Hi, uh, practitioner. And over the course of the last hour, I had a little bit of a, a transformation. Is that good or bad? Is that good or bad? It's good. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to ask you about that, though. Okay. <laughs> As an academic. Uh, I came in thinking that leading when you're not there is something I've learned about that might help me fill in that I'm missing in the leadership frameworks we mm -hmm. use when we develop in, in our organization. When I listen and, and, and digest it as much as I've been able to, the, the three uh, parts of this that you share in the framework, uh, it feels more like a complete leadership framework. It's replacing a lot of what I'm 
spot kind of in place already. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that, whether you're, you're putting it out as that. So, so you say it's a complete leadership framework in it. Competencies uh, that I would expect to use with leadership development uh, in, a, in a more holistic manner. Yeah. So, so it is very holistic. It's not a piece. It's a, it's a philosophy or an ideology or, or a holistic approach to leadership in general. Uh, I think that, I, I think I restated it, yeah. Um, uh, yes, and, and one of the questions I hear behind your question is, so what's new here? No, okay. is there something that you're explicitly not covering in this? I don't know, can we all be very kind of the Selden character at this point? You know, it seems to me leaders are, are leading more from a, a vantage point of not being there than they are when they are there lately. Yes, so this is becoming the norm. Yeah, no, and, and th this is becoming the norm, and I think when we talk about global leadership in general, this is becoming the norm. Um, in the past, it used to be okay to be a sloppy leader because you were dealing with, compared with today, a, a, re a relatively closed system with high physical presence. And so if things didn't go the way you expected or you spontaneously decided to do it differently, you could do that because you could, but, um, but, but with the more open systems, more complexity and bigger scope today, there, we don't have the room for maneuvering uh, that we used to have. And, and on the one hand, that can be discouraging there's no room for mistakes. We, everybody needs to be a better leader. And I've had some conversations recently with, with CEOs who are really worried about their senior managers who are, um, are experiencing high levels of stress about their own lack of competence. It's, lead, leadership has just become too complicated. You know, I don't know if I can do it anymore. Uh, and of course, then they never say that, so it comes out as scapegoating and they blame all kinds of other things. Um, but it's really uh, their own fear about their own leadership. Uh, and so I think that, that it, there are a couple of things that come out of that. One is we really need to help leaders to understand what it is to be better at. But the other piece of it is, is to say, no, there, you know, in manufacturing and other places, and, Manufacturing is a mechanical system, so now it's, but we've been able to reduce variance. I mean, we can tool up. We're, we can get lots better at some things, and that that gives us other opportunities. Um, is it, it, we don't need to control as much. We, if we're Harry Seldon, it's also there, therefore about letting go of control. And this is the you know the fluid authority is knowing when it's okay to step back and you don't have to control everything. And if you're really good at the few things you put in place then it's okay to step back. And in fact, it's even exciting to step back and see what else happens. Yeah, so thank you. I think in terms of timing, we're done. So I hope that what we got out of this first little bit is a setting of the agenda. Okay, and, and these kinds of questions or challenges, uh, disagreements, uh, uh, th these are all great. Um, and I, look, I really look forward to the next parts of the agenda. So thank you very much. <laughs>